I am excited about this event. We've been doing a few uh, of these types of events where my co-authors call in from prison and talk to folks over Zoom, and they've gone really well, so I'm excited to offer this opportunity to you. Just a little bit about how I got involved. Um, I, as you heard before, I'm a writer, and I write a lot about criminal justice stuff, but the death penalty was never something that I was particularly focused on in my writing, and I actually came to the death penalty completely by accident. I was at a Super Bowl party back in 2013. I'm not a football person at all, and so I was just kind of eating food, um, and this guy wandered over and started talking to me. Turns out he was a prison psychologist, and he worked specifically with men on death row. So we got to talking, and I was asking him all kinds of questions about what it was like and what the guys were like. And he told me that they had a new warden at Central Prison who had just come on. And for the very first time in the history of death row, they were opening up the prison to allow volunteers to come in and teach, teach classes on death row. Uh, they were teaching yoga, they were teaching art, they were teaching restorative justice, just a, a bunch of really incredible classes were starting to be offered. And I asked if I could teach a writing class. So he asked me to apply, and I applied and I got in. And so I started going to the prison regularly into death row. Uh, in North Carolina, all the people condemned to die in the state, which is, it fluctuates between 140 and 150 people usually, they're all kept in the same prison in Raleigh. And so I went into that prison and I taught a class to about, I had about two dozen guys who were signed up for my class, who I saw regularly. And we started a, a writing class. It wasn't about how to write grammatically, it was about how to share your story, how to journal, how to think through your past. Um, and so I, I got to know them really well, I felt, through that, and was moved by the, the men that I saw and the level of insight and emotional maturity. Uh, and the path to death row and how they got there. And so I decided to write a, um, an article for the newspaper here, the News Observer, based in Raleigh. And I wanted to advocate for basically the idea that men on death row are, are human beings, very simple idea. So I wrote that article and I published it and I got kicked out of the prison for doing that. And they canceled my class. <coughs> so at that point, I started writing letters to the men who had been my students and formed um, written correspondence with several of them. And after I think a couple of years of writing back and forth, I had a stack of letters that again, were just bursting with, with insights and so many, um, so many things I wanted to share with the world. And so I proposed the idea of writing a book with four uh, of the, the people I was writing with. And after three years <laughs> of writing back and forth and coming up with chapters, we created Crimson Letters, Voices from Death Row, which was co-written by all five of us together. Uh, each, of the, each of us has basically our own section within the group. And we got it published in March of this year. So we're super, super excited about that. And as soon as it got published, a week later, the prison system banned it from all North Carolina prisons. So, and they confiscated it from my authors. They went, in and they went into their cells and they took the books away from them. So they're not even allowed to have copies of their own writing in the prison. Uh, and we're on the list of banned books, but in good company. We have the new Jim Crow on that list of banned books, the color purple, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. So honestly getting banned was like one of my proudest moments, I think. <laughs> Um, and so since then, we've been, we've been doing promotion uh, for this book, or like podcast interviews and things like that. And each of my co-authors have been calling in to talk about their paths to death row. Uh, the book mostly goes through how they got there, uh, the kind of circumstances that they grew up in, the kind of choices that they made that led to getting a death sentence. And then how they search for purpose and meaning, meaning even in prison, even behind bars. 
because each of them in their own way has found a, a purpose in prison and they all have sort of their own interests um, and their own areas of expertise. And, and it's really interesting and incredible, I think, that they've been able to grow and, and to thrive in a way, even in circumstances which you can read are, are very inhuman. My daughter. Um, so today we're gonna have two people on the call who are co-authors of mine. They're gonna call in from Central Prison. The first one is Lyle May. And Lyle May was convicted in 1999 of a double murder, which happened when he was having a psychotic break. Uh, he struggles with mental health issues a lot for most of his life and um, substance use. Um, and the murders happened in Asheville, which is one reason why I'm having him call in. But Lyle, since then, has become really, really interested in uh, higher education. And he's getting a master's degree right now in um, criminal justice from Ohio University, all on his own. That's not something that the prison offers at all. He had to find people to sponsor it, people to help him pay for the program, and he has struggled uh, to get that degree. So that's sort of his his thing. He's a big advocate for advocate for higher learning inside of prison. And then we're going to talk uh, to Michael Braxton our next caller. And Michael Braxton was, has been on death row since 1997. So he's the longest running one uh, of all the guys. He was um, convicted of stabbing a fellow prisoner to death about 27 years ago. And Michael Braxton is an amazing writer, a poet, he's a musician, and um, someone who's very, very open and honest about his past and about um, about who he is today. So I'm looking forward to you having opportunities to ask them questions. Uh, as far as the questions themselves, you can ask any questions that you want, except about specifically the crimes themselves, um, beyond what I just told you. And the reason for that is because each of the men are still going through an appeal process with their cases. Um, so they're not allowed to talk about the cases at all. But other than that, any kinds of questions that you have are basically fair game. If you're sort of not sure what questions you want to ask, I did include in the, the chat section, if you go to the bottom of the screen, there are some questions um, that you can take, uh, or you can ask your own questions. And the way that we're going to do that, since there's a lot of people on the call and uh, we don't want people to talk over each other or not be sure when it's their turn to speak, if you want to ask a question, if you can just put the question in the chat box and I will call on you and then give you the opportunity, you'll get unmuted um, and then you'll be able to ask the question. And feel free to steal any of the questions that, that are on there. That's why. That's what they're there for, if you can't think of any of your own. Um, so Lyle is the first one gonna call. He's gonna call at four o'clock, so that's in 15 minutes. Um, so before he calls, does anybody have any questions for me about writing the book, about the process, about any questions that you would like to ask me? stuff in the chat box. Do you have any, Mick, while we're, um, any questions while we're waiting for people to write? Um, I guess I, I would be curious to hear, like, uh, if I, because I, I, the story that you, that you shared was familiar to me. I think I read it on your, your website about um, how you were essentially like banned, your class was canceled. Um, has there been any further like uh, updates with that? Did you ever try like in your correspondence to go in and maybe see your authors or were you allowed to do that? Was there any type of like further ramifications from that? Mm -hmm. um, so after I got banned, I did appeal the decision and was denied the appeal. 
Um, then I applied to get on the visitor list and I was able to get on the visitor list. So I started visiting Lyle, the first guy you're gonna hear from. Um, but then I wanted to visit the other guys too. I didn't wanna just visit him. And you're unfortunately only allowed to be on one person's visitor list at a time. Mm. Uh, so when I went off of his list and tried to apply for someone else, uh, they, I was denied all of those. Um, so for some reason they will only let me talk to him. <laughs> talk um, somebody has a question. Mm -hmm. Looks like Lynn, what was the most surprising thing you learned about life in prison while writing this book? That's a great question. I would love to tell you. <laughs> um, so I had a very, um, I think, common but incorrect misperception about the death penalty when I went into the prison. I believed that people on death row were there because they had committed the worst of the worst crimes. They, they were the torturers, the serial killers, uh, all of that. The most surprising thing that I learned was that that's not true. There are people on death row who've been convicted of very grisly crimes, but there's also people on death row who have not even been convicted of killing anyone at all. You can be on death row simply for, um, I'll give you a, a specific example. One of the guys who was my students in the class, he had been participating in a robbery. He was a robbery of a, a convenience store. He was the getaway driver. So while the robbery was happening, he was outside the whole time. He was unarmed. Um, and while the robbery occurred, one of the guys got spooked and he ended up shooting the, um, the clerk at the store. So what happened with the trials was that the guy in my class who was the getaway driver had not killed anybody was sentenced to death row. Well, the three guys who were in the store, including the one who had actually shot someone, were not sentenced to death. And those kind of disparities are things that I learned are actually really common. And it has to do with uh, some racial stuff. It has to do with the criminal history of the defendant, how good your lawyer is, all of these things factor in so you can wind up with people on death row who, who didn't even kill anyone at all um, and so that was probably the most shocking thing to me uh, I learned that the biggest determinant of whether or not you get the death penalty is the county that the trial occurs in because there are certain counties where the district attorneys who, who are the ones who choose whether or not to pursue the death penalty they don't, for political reasons, they, they don't really like pursuing the death penalty. It's not a county where people really want to see it. And so those attorneys may choose not to pursue the death penalty, even in cases where uh, the person might qualify. And then there are other counties where it's very politically expedient to pursue the death penalty always. And so in those counties, for every single first degree murder, they will always pursue the death penalty. So it's just really sort of a question of, of geography. Um, so that was probably the most surprising thing. I mean, I've been working in criminal justice a while, so I guess I shouldn't be surprised at these kind of disparities existing. But for some reason, I, I really thought that, that for something as serious as a death penalty, there, there would be higher standards, I guess. Um, and that was the biggest surprise. Good question. Tessie, do you know off the top of your head which counties in North Carolina have the, the, the highest rate for prosecuting for the death penalty? Yeah, Lee County. Lee County. And they prosecute every single first degree murder as death penalty. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> no exceptions. <laughs> and then, like, like Durham, I actually live in Durham now. So, Durham County, we don't ever use the death penalty. So, it's really yeah, it's crazy. Um, cool yeah maybe i can just because we we have had some new folks join the call um so welcome uh folks who are just joining where uh my name is mick i'm with firestorm books and coffee and i'm talking with tessie castillo 
and we are waiting for one of her co-authors on this uh, recently released book uh, collection of letters called Crimson Letters. Um, one of her co-authors, uh, Lyle, is going to be calling in at four, and then another co-author, uh, Michael, will be calling in shortly after that. So we'll have an opportunity to speak with both of them today. And right now, we have about five minutes before Lyle's calling in. So if you do have any questions, um, you can write them in the chat box, and and we can. If you have any questions for Tessie, we can answer those now. One question I often get from people is what the process of writing the book was like. Um, it was very, very challenging if you think about it. Uh, we're five different people and we didn't have, they don't have access to internet in the prison. They don't, uh, they didn't have phones either when we started. The phones are a relatively new thing. It used to be on death row up until 2016 that you only had one 10 minute phone call every year. So right around Christmas, they would be able to call one person for 10 minutes and that was it. And then in 2016, they installed phones. So they do have access to phones right now. They can only speak for 15 minutes each. So you'll see on our call that they'll get cut off after 15 minutes, but they will be able to call back. So we'll try to see if Lyle can call twice. And then um, Michael, who's also called Aleem, so you may hear me call him that, uh, we'll also try to call twice so that we get to 5 o'clock. Um, but we didn't have, so we didn't even have the phones when we started writing this book because it was before 2016. And so it was all letters. <laughs> and it took a really long time to, to do the edits and, and to get essays through letters. Uh, but also, it wasn't just about the process of writing and editing. It was about decisions that had to be made. When you write a book, there's a lot of business decisions um, about the content of the book, about whether or not to go with such and such a publisher. And I really tried to make this a, a very transparent and collaborative effort. So every business decision that had to be made, I would write letters to the four different guys, and I would wait for them to get the letters back to me. And they usually disagreed completely on everything. <laughs> and so then I would have to decide, okay, uh, <laughs> how do we come to a consensus? We couldn't meet in a room to talk about it together. We couldn't do phone calls. Um, so I would try to just keep writing letters and say, okay, well, this guy wanted this decision and, and this guy argued this. What do you think? Uh, and so sometimes it took a really, really long time to be able to get a decision made with all of those different steps that had to happen, which is one reason why the process took four years to write the book. Uh, and it, yeah, it was just, it was very challenging. Um, originally, there were actually five co-authors and one of them dropped out through the process. Almost every single one of the rest of us, including me, either dropped out or almost dropped out at some point in the process when it just got too too much just just too complicated and we were disagreeing on things and so it was not this smooth kumbaya process it was actually um it, it was hard and and there were a lot of times when i didn't think that we would make it to the point of actually publishing anything um there were times when even i had almost given up so the fact that we did make it and that we did publish it and that we're here and we're talking to people who have read or, or are interested in the book is to me kind of amazing. <laughs> I'm really excited about it. Um, and I know it means a lot to the guys too when they call in. Um, they don't hardly get to talk to, to anybody. You know, Lyle has been in, on death row for t more than 20 years. Um, and for the longest time, you know, no one ever talked to him or, or he had this impression that everyone outside of the prison thought that he was a monster. And so for them to be able to participate in these kind of events is just really life changing and to be heard for the very first time. So thank you for even giving them a platform uh, because it means more to them than you could probably ever know. Um, any other questions? <laughs> 
you think we'll have the opportunity? So in terms of like Lyle calling in, I know you're you're asking for questions and there's these sample questions. Will we hear from Lyle as well? Just um, is, about anything that they want to share with us or? Yeah, he's calling yeah. right now. Okay, cool. Great. And then Lyle, hello Lyle, are you there? Hello. Yep. Hey Lyle. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep, we can hear you loud and clear. <laughs> um, thank you for being on the call, Al. Can you just give folks a quick uh, introduction about yourself, and then we'll see if they have questions. And for everyone okay. while he's talking, if you can start writing your questions in the chat box to get them ready, that would be great. My name is Lyle May, and I am a contributing writer to Crimson Letters, Voices from Death Row. Uh, I've been on Raleigh, in Raleigh Central Prison for the last uh, 21 years. Uh, that puts me in prison now for uh, 23 years as of this July. I've been incarcerated since I was 19 years old. But even though I have been on death row all this time, I've not been idle. I've managed to earn an associate's degree in 2013 from Ohio University's uh, college program for the incarcerated. I'm currently enrolled in a bachelor of specialized studies degree program in criminal justice administration. I've uh, recently been inducted to the Alpha Sigma Lambda Honor Society. And uh, when I'm not studying, I write just about every day. I currently write for Scalawag Magazine, uh, regular articles about uh, my experiences in prison, uh, on death row, and issues that relate to that incarceration that affect everybody. All right, thank you. Um, while we're waiting for folks to come up with questions, I'll ask a couple. Um, can you tell us, Lyle, a little bit about uh, your background and where, how you grew up? So I was born in Jacksonville, Florida. My dad was in the Navy. He was uh, enlisted. Um, but eventually he retired and got out, and we ended up moving to Maine, where I spent the majority of my childhood. Um, I have three sisters and three brothers. Uh, two of my brothers are older half-brothers from my dad's first marriage. But uh, from my mom's uh, children, I am the middle child. Uh, growing up in Maine is typical, I, I guess, uh, as far as suburban uh, childhood can be typical. Um, I grew up on the coast, uh, so there, we were within walking distance of the shoreline. Um, my childhood kind of took a turn for the worst, uh, pretty much once I hit puberty and, uh, discovered the world of drugs and, uh, negative peer influence. I ultimately dropped out of high school, um, and got involved in a, a number of delinquent behaviors that put me in the main youth center, uh, frequently. And I was in and out. I was never any long stretch of time, uh, mostly because the crimes that I committed as a juvenile were status offenses. Uh, and status offenses such as, you know, running away from home and smoking and drinking and things of that nature, once you were already on probation, managed to land you back in youth detention and kind of go through that uh, cycle of juvenile recidivism. Thanks. Uh, so we do have a question from Amber. Can we unmute her so she can ask? Yes. Uh, hey there, can you all hear me? Yep. Great. Yep. Hey Lyle, it's Amber. Um, I was just wondering if you can talk a little bit about the particular challenges that you face as a writer in prison? Foremost amongst the challenges of writing in prison is the lack of internet access and fresh information uh, related to 
topics that I, I choose to write about. Uh, I'm fortunate that I have uh, a number of friends who are willing to look things up for me and send me articles as they arise. Uh, my academic advisor at Ohio University, Kyle McKenzie, was instrumental uh, once phones were installed on death row. She, you know, kind of really helped bring my writing into uh, the 21st century uh, by sending me a number of criminal justice related articles from the Marshall Project and Slate Magazine and various online sources. Uh, another challenge is, in addition to the lack of uh, internet access, is the lack of technology. Um, I don't have a typewriter. All of my writing is done by hand. Uh, a lot of the people who receive work from me get it in pencil because I really despise <laughs> writing in pen because you can't erase pen and there are no pen ink erasers. And it seems like such a small thing uh, having to uh, rewrite a page, when, but when you, you write as, as much as uh, I do or any uh, serious writer does in prison, then you end up doing a lot of rewriting uh, and it tends to burn through quite a bit of paper. Thank you, Lyle. Um, can you talk a little bit about if, if you could do things over again in your life, what would you do differently? Stay in school is always going to be my first answer. Uh, staying in school, I believe, would have uh, significantly altered my life course. It would have helped me make better decisions, uh, certainly decisions more critical of the influences I was around and and the people I was uh, all too willing to take advice from. Uh, unfortunately, it was strong wrong advice, uh, not the advice I should have been listening to. But uh, education, at, a very, at the very least, would have given me uh, more opportunities to pursue jobs other than those that earn minimum wage, uh, would have helped develop skill sets, uh, and maybe even go to college. Uh, and I, I can't stress enough how important it, it is to stay in school and to pursue higher education, even if that higher education is vocational training. It doesn't always have to be a post-secondary degree-bearing school. It can be uh, vocational uh, skills. Uh, it can be uh, tech, uh, I guess you'd call it uh, IT now. Um, but yeah, that, that's probably the very first thing I would change. Okay. Um, feel free folks to write questions in the chat box if you have any, uh, but I'll keep asking them <laughs> if people don't. Um, so speaking of education, Lyle, I know that higher education is very important to you, but it's something that you were not at all interested in when you came to death row. So can you talk about how you discovered uh, higher education and how you started pursuing it um, and how it's become important to you? I didn't, you're right, I didn't initially uh, have any interest in higher education when I first came to death row. I was really trying to get my bearings and, and to understand how I wound up in this place and, you know, with executions going on and, and you know, learning the people around me, it was a uh, struggle, uh, but fortunately, there are some were some older people around who could really take me aside and say, "Hey, you know, look, this is what you need to do," uh, and really sat me down and taught me uh, how to mature into an adult and, and make adult decisions. Uh, one of those decisions uh, is holding yourself accountable for every day that you're in prison and. Well, I don't mean necessarily uh, in terms of legal accountability because that's always a, a tricky subject to talk about. What I do mean is the things that you do every day that make you who you are and how your future will develop. Well, one of the things I, I began doing is uh, attending Catholic Mass almost immediately. I grew up Catholic. Uh, so I, I returned to Catholicism, and uh, through that I, I began, you know, reestablishing my my faith in God, and that kind of helped uh, settle me, so to speak. And it was in so doing.
knowing that I was uh, provided an opportunity to take that first correspondence course. And by this point, I'm about 25 or 26, and I'd been on uh, death row for about five or six years. And, you know, I'd matured enough to where I, I knew I needed something to do, and I needed to do more than just watch TV or play uh, tabletop games or, you know, read fantasy novels all day. Uh, I need something to challenge my mind, and that correspondence course was something to do that with. And even in taking that first correspondence course, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to take a correspondence course and, and get a degree. It was like, wow, I really need something to do with my time. And the first course so happened to be social interaction, the very thing I needed to learn the most about. Uh, and from there, my mind was kind of set ablaze with the the potential of learning about my environment and uh, practically applying what it was I had learned in social psychology. And it took off from there. I enrolled in uh, two courses the next time and then another two courses until, you know, year after year, I stacked courses together and before I knew it, I had a degree. But that journey, I, I don't mean to understate it, is... A very long one uh, that took uh, approximately from 04 to 2013 before I earned that degree, and it was a slow and painful and difficult process. Thanks, Lyle. That's a great segue. We have an academic question here. Um, does Amanda want to ask her question? Hi, thank you all so much for doing this. Um, my question was to think about like what sort of impediments are there to expanding uh, educational and vocational opportunities in prison programs. Um, I, as you mentioned in the introduction that there was some kind of blowback from local communities about like who should have access to such opportunities and so I wonder is that still such a huge problem. <laughs> The problem is largely one of funding. The moment you have constituents in uh, various voting blocks who hear that uh, people in prison are being given uh, money to, or not even directly, but indirectly, given money to attend uh, post-secondary degree-bearing programs or vocational programs that lead to uh, some kind of licensure, they, you know, they get up in arms, they uh, get angry over the, the idea that somebody in prison would be given that second opportunity. But the thing that many of those same people fail to remember is that the majority, 90 to 95 percent of the people who are currently incarcerated will get out someday. And you want them to be trained. You want them to be educated so that by the time they return to the street, they're well equipped to hold a job and you have 60 seconds remaining. Rather than the wrong things. Um, it's not just funding, though, too, Amanda. I mean, I was a volunteer inside the prison, and I was told not to tell anyone that I was teaching a writing class because there was a fear that if people knew that there were classes in the prison, that they would think that being on death row was like a cushy thing. <laughs> Oh, they're getting all these opportunities. They're not being punished. You have 30 seconds remaining. Stigma is a big thing. Uh, Lyle, can you call back? Yep. Hold on a sec. Okay. Thanks. Um, so he's going to call back. Also, if uh, anyone here is connected to any universities, we do uh, call-ins like this to classes too. Like if you're teaching a class on social work or criminal justice or anything that could sort of relate to this theme, uh, we do talk to students and Lyle can call in or any of my other co-authors. Um, so you can just message me through my website, uh, tessiecastillo.com and I can write it down. Um, and we would be happy to set something up. In fact, I'll just put my email. <laughs> I will talk to churches or like any groups, really other um, groups who want to hear us. All right, he's calling back. Okay. Cool, Lyle should be good to go and unmuted. 
Can you hear us, Lyle? Hello? Yep. Hey. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Um, we might only have 10 minutes for this one because Aleem's supposed to call in at 4.30, so <laughs> back to back. Okay. Um, we have a question from Elena. <laughs> Hi, Lyle. Um, I thank you so much for calling in and sharing your story. I um, actually took I'm a student at UNC and um, read and heard a lot from you in Frank Baumgartner's class on the death penalty. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you for sharing all of this. But I was wondering um, how you've seen death row change since you've been living there in terms of, you know, technological changes, but also any social changes that have taken um, since you've been there or anything else that you've seen happen over the course of your time living there? The biggest change is the stoppage of executions. Um, once they were kind of unofficially put on hold, everybody kind of really held their breath and were like, okay, is, is this going to be for a short period of time or a long period of time? Because even in the months and year leading up to the unofficial uh, stoppage, it was like, okay, well, we surely they, they're going to stop it soon because uh, I think during that time uh, a number of people had gotten off of death row, uh, had their sentences reversed. A few, uh, Alan Gill had recently been exonerated and the um, U.S. Supreme Court had overturned the sentences of the, the juveniles as well as the uh, those who were intellectually disabled. So we felt that change coming and then when it happened it wasn't sudden, it was long and drawn out. Uh, so it was actually two or three years after the last execution that we were like, okay, well, surely they're going to start it back this year or this year. And then finally it was, uh, you know, on hold, uh, I guess you'd say, for the foreseeable future. Um, and then, you know, the Racial Justice Act uh, was certainly uh, a big thing. Uh, when it was first passed, a lot of people thought, oh, gee, this is really going to change how we look at uh, the death penalty. This is really going to change um, the future for everybody. It could potentially even uh, end the death penalty as we know it. But, you know, those are external uh, legal issues that, you know, kind of influence our thinking in here. As far as the inside goes, uh, not a lot of the day-to-day -day changes until, you, like I said, the executions ended, and then I guess the next real big change came along with uh, Dr. Kuhn's uh, psychological programs, and things changed drastically, I would say, because the the idea that we would be given programs and treated uh, as if we can be rehabilitated uh, was new to everybody. For so long, we've been told the only purpose we are on death row is to die. Um, and dealing with that in your thought process, in your daily, uh, in your daily thinking, is is difficult. It's not something that you just suddenly overcome. It's it's not something that goes away. It's there, uh, just like. You think about walking your dog. Well, I got to take my dog out. Well, I'm on death row. I have to remember that. Uh, it's just it doesn't go away. So these classes did something uh, very different than uh, any previous time that I'd been on death row. They improved morale. They changed the way staff looked at us. They changed the way the rest of the prison viewed death row is like, oh, wait, they're putting on plays. They're, they're capable of interacting with staff. We, we didn't think that was possible. And then Dr. Kuhn showed people that it is possible. You just have to treat people like they're humans. Uh, and, and that was uh, a very dynamic change. So when those things ended, it was uh, kind of an end to an era. Uh, and the end to thinking that, well, these these guys are, are worth these programs. Uh, they're, you know, these are something that they should have available to them. Uh, and this goes back to the question about resistance 
uh, to education in prison. Well, it's not just about funding, as Tessie said, and, it, and it's not just about uh, people who are want to be quiet about the programs. They had to be quiet about the programs because there are factions of staff. There is a, a, a frame of mind that believes that people on death row should only be there to die and that they will always be there to die and that they cannot be rehabilitated. And the problem with that thinking, the problem with that philosophy is that every action that defies that puts the lie to it. And that's one of the most powerful things about the programs that Dr. Coons brought here is our every action put lie to those that idea that we are not human, that idea that we cannot be rehabilitated. He, in fact, proved that anybody can be rehabilitated. Just to provide a little bit of context, Dr. Coons is the psycholo psychologist that I mentioned when I was first talking, the guy I met at a Super Bowl, who, uh, Super Bowl party, who invited me to first participate. And he was the impetus behind all of the classes that were in the prison for about three years. They had regular classes, uh, not mine, of course. I was um, removed from the prison within the first year. Uh, <laughs> Then in after three, it was around three years, right? Then Dr. Coons was essentially pushed out of the prison and all of the classes were stopped. So they're not doing them anymore. Um, the other thing Lyle mentioned is that, that there's a moratorium. There was a moratorium on the death penalty since uh, 2006 and then in, in North Carolina. And then in 2013, the moratorium was lifted, but now there's a lawsuit uh, concerning the lethal injection cocktail. And that's why they have not executed anyone uh, since 2006. Um, you only have maybe a couple minutes left, Lyle. Can you talk briefly about what it was like for you when the executions were happening? You write about this in the book uh, for folks who haven't read it. It's a very, very moving chapter on the people who, um, Lyle's friends who were executed. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like? The executions were hard. I don't think there's really any easier way to describe it than that. It is something that always weighed on the mind. Uh, it's something that made you want to stay in bed and, and not wake up. It's something that you had to deal with. It's something that we lived with every day and every night. Uh, when an execution was happening uh, or about to happen, a lot of guys would do their best to busy themselves with, you know, mindless tasks, uh, playing card games or watching the TV and just doing their best to really tune it out the whole time that they're thinking about it. There's, there's no way to tune it out. Uh, and then when the execution occurs, it's it's kind of it's one of those things where you're you're forced to contemplate it. You're forced to think of yourself in those same shoes of whoever is being executed, and that's a, a very uh, it's, it's a horrible thing to have to think of yourself uh, strapped to a gurney and about to be given a lethal injection. And then in the aftermath of that, you know, you feel guilty for thinking like that because you you should be thinking about the, the man that they just put to death. And instead, you were thinking about yourself. But, you know, it's a very. Shit. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was Aleem. He called and I asked him to call back in five minutes. And when I hung up, then Lyle lost the call too. Uh, so anyways, Aleem's going to call in five minutes. <laughs> okay. Do you think? Do you think that's the last that we'll hear from Lyle? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, no, that was really great. Really appreciated their answers. And yeah, this is the first time we've had more than one person call in for the same event. Uh huh. Um, and I probably won't do that again. Uh huh. It's just cool. easier to to have one mm -hmm. one guy so that you don't run into overlaps and. Mm -hmm. And stuff like that. Uh, but great questions for the people who did ask questions. Those were, those were really fantastic. Um, yeah, Lyle, so in the, I guess I'll talk a little bit about the book club while we're, while we're waiting. Um, 
So the book club is uh, basically an opportunity to dive a little bit more deeply into the book and to get to know all four of the, the co-authors. The book is divided into four sections and each co-author writes his own section. And it talks about his journey to death row and what life is like inside the prison and how they find hope and purpose, even living under a death sentence. And so the book club takes place over the course of four weeks. So in the first week, uh, you will come to the meeting, which is going to be a Zoom meeting, just like this one, expected to have read the first section, which is George's section. And then so when we meet like this, George will call into the to the meeting uh, and we'll get to talk with him. And typically there's a lot more back and forth. So uh, we'll have the opportunity to ask him questions and he'll have the opportunity to ask us questions. Um, and there's a discussion of the, the chapters that he wrote in his book. And then during the second week, we have the second author call in and discuss, and we have a discussion of his chapters and so on and so forth. So Lyle is actually the fourth and final author in the book. So he writes the very last chapters. Um, and the reason that I chose him to, or we chose him to write the last chapters is because he does have some really moving uh, sections on the executions and on what that was like for him to go through it. Uh, many, many times, they, dozens of people were executed uh, since he first came to prison. And then um, he talks at the very end about education and this particular mentor that he had on death row and how much that relationship meant to him and how much it took him from someone who when he got to death row was constantly depressed was um, cutting himself self-mutilating didn't want anything to do with anybody to someone who's pursuing a degree and publishing a book and he writes articles regularly for magazines and he calls into universities and colleges and speaks to the students and he's really become an advocate um, in a number of ways and, and so he talks about that uh, change in his life so that's why we put it at the end of the book. Um, Aleem is the third author so the reason I had the two of them call in today was so that if you do join the book club, you'll get to hear two new authors first in week one and two who you did not hear today. And then uh, if you want to continue with the rest of the book club, you'll hear Aleem and Lyle again. Um, so it's really been great so far. It's, it's very, it's like an intimate little group and everyone participates. Uh, we usually have a lot of questions during the book club. Everybody has questions that they ask because they've read the material and so they have a lot to, to go on and they know a lot about the guys before the phone call. Um, Aleem has an interesting story. He, Michael Braxton, who's gonna call in soon, he has been, he spent almost eight years in solitary confinement and it had a profound shift on his psyche uh, at first, well, very, very negatively, <laughs> as you might imagine. Um, so that's something that you could certainly ask him about, is about what it was like to be cut off from human beings for, for almost eight years and what that did for him. Um, but since then, he's, he's just really made this remarkable uh, recovery, and he is a recording artist, so he produces stuff. I can probably send you guys a link. Um, he likes to write music and he has people who work with him. So he'll call just like he's calling now and he'll uh, do his rhymes and, and stuff and the producers will put them to music. And that's something that really gives him a lot of hope and um, just a sense of purpose while he's in prison as well. He's also very close to his family and, and I'm close to his family. So I text with his mom all the time. <laughs> And that's pretty much, that's how I get messages to them in prison. So like for this event, the way that I told them, you need to call in on May 26th, but I would just texted Aleem's mother uh, because he calls her every day and said, hey, can you make sure that he calls in? This is him. Cool. And, and while Tessie is patching in, uh, Michael here, just to give folks a heads up in the chat there, I dropped both the link for the book club 
um, for folks to sign up for and a link to uh, purchase the book from Firestorm. Um, so that's the book listed on Firestorm's website. Um, and yeah, I, I, it's, we, have a, we have 12 participants on the call today. If you're looking for a deeper dive into this work, um, the book club is a great way to go about doing that. Um, so yeah, thanks. Hey, yeah, I'm just gonna talk to you right now. Hear us? Hello? Hey, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, we can hear you really well. Thank you for calling in. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we have 13 people on the call. Can you, this is a, a call with a bookstore in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, can you just give us just a little bit of an introduction and background to you? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name's Arlene. Um, I'm on death row. Been locked up for about 27 years. Been on death row since 1997. I did about 10 years in solitary confinement. And um, I met Tessie about 2014-ish. And, you know, eventually we got together and wrote this book. Good. <laughs> Um, so if people have questions for Aleem, if you could just write it in the chat box, uh, I'll get started by asking you a couple questions. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your music, Aleem, and the ways that you find hope and purpose on death row? Oh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I've been emceeing since I was like 13. It's been like my, you know, greatest, you know, passion in life is, you know, I just, started writing rhymes, you know, when I was a young kid and, you know, when I came to prison and particularly after doing so many years on solitary is that I just used music and my rhymes as a, you know, a way of self-therapy. You know, some of the things that I was going through in my life, some of the, you know, heavy things that I had been carrying on my heart and on my mind, I just started using my lyrics to, you know, kind of channel some of that, you know, those feelings and put it in a creative way to the point where, you know, I didn't, I felt like that I could focus more on the creativity and not really focus on, you know, um, what people thought about what I was saying. You know, sometimes that could be like a hindrance is, you know, wondering if people are going to judge me if I say this or, or say that. But if I put it in a way that was creative, I could focus more on the creativity and not focus on people's reaction to, you know, what I was saying. So, you know, that just became, you know, a, a huge, you know, form of, thor of therapy for me. And, you know, after so many years, um, when we actually got access to telephones here in 2016, is I decided to start publishing some of my rhymes and putting them on SoundCloud. And I've been doing that since about 2018. And, um, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm still excited about that. And that's still, you know, a huge part of my life. And just feel like I have this opportunity, to, you know, to continue to pursue some of my ambitions, you know, even in a circumstance like this. Thank you. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the important relationships in your life that have really kept you um, kept you alive you know, on death row? Oh yeah, um, absolutely. My mom, you know, me and my mom, you know, I'm, I'm mama's first born, you know, uh, that's kind of the title of the song I got. And, um, you know, my mom, I'm biracial, so my mother's white. And just, you know, the things that, you know, we've gone through together in life, you know, um, I just feel like that it's, it's, it's strengthened us and, and, you know, has us so strongly connected, you know, and just being being by my side throughout everything that I've endured, all of the, you know, embarrassment, the humiliation, the pain that I've put my mother through is nonetheless is that she's continued to support me you know, um, and be there for me emotionally, you know, as well as, you know, um, physically and, you know, just being by my side through every aspect of this journey, never uh, faltering, never abandoning me, you know, and I mean, like I say, you know, I've, I put up through so much that, you know, it's just, it's just heartbreaking to, you know, recollect, especially now that I'm 47, but, um, you know, that's definitely the, the strongest relationship that I have, but I, you know, also my mama taught me when I was young, you know, I got a younger brother and I had a younger sister that just passed away in February. And my mama taught us when we was young that we all we got. The family is all you got. You know, in this world that you might meet one friend, you know, everybody else is just associates that pass through. So 
for family, that's all you got. But she told me to always take care of my brother, always take care of my sister, always help one another. And, you know, to this day is that, you know, those are life lessons that, you know, that still run true. And I still got my brother in my life. We're really strongly connected. And my sister, you know, that was my heart. I love her to death, you know. And she just passed away in February. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Mick. Hey there, Aline. Uh, my name's Mick. I I work at the bookstore um, that's hosting this event. Um, so I just wanted to say congrats, congrats on the book and it getting published. Um, yeah, and I was yeah I was curious to ask you um, about COVID nineteen and um, you know the virus that is quickly spreading uh, globally and just uh, what that situation is like where you are and, and how that's being handled and what your access to like uh, soap and and like um, just like hygiene. Um, yeah, what, what your access to that kind of stuff is and if you think it's being adequately addressed. Okay, all right, what's up Nick, man? Nice to meet you. Um, yeah, you know, COVID-19, you know, um, I'm honestly viewing it, you know, kind of as a, you know, person on the sidelines is that, you know, I'm thankful and grateful that, you know, we haven't had, you know, any cases here at Central Prison. Um, I think from, you know, what I've been told, this is the uh, main prison in North Carolina where the hospital is. So they have brought one or two people here, you know, and um, quarantined them in the hospital. But as far as infection, is none of the inmates thus far have, you know, contracted the coronavirus. And um, as far as, you know, protocols that, you know, have come into place to, um, you know, I guess safeguard us or whatever, um, you know, we got some masks. Um, we do have a access to some cleaning supplies. Just within the last couple of weeks, as I've noticed at night, they bring some this huge machine around with like a fan on it. And I think it's, you know, sprays out some disinfectant, you know, for maybe about 10 minutes just to, you know, I guess kind of sanitize the block. But um, for the most part, you know, we practice in social distancing. Um, we go to the dining hall. Everybody wears our face masks. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, like I say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm watching this thing from the sideline. I'm seeing it more on TV and, um, you know, in the news than actually experiencing any of, you know, the realities that, you know, a lot of people may be experiencing on the outside. Mm. You're lucky not all prisons are so fortunate. <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit about, so what were your thoughts about the death penalty before you came to prison? Well, I didn't really have no thoughts about the death penalty. I was, you know, I wasn't that politically conscious or, you know, aware of the dynamics of, you know, the criminal justice system. I vaguely remember that there was, you know, you know, maybe an execution or, or, or two in my lifetime prior to coming to prison. Because I live right down the street from Central Prison, I grew up past the prison a gazillion times in my life. But just wasn't that you know, you know, I was young and really, you know, wasn't that involved, wasn't paying attention to things around me. So I really didn't have a um a vested interest in it. Um, I think my mom was, you know, a supporter of the death penalty. Um, but it wasn't something that you know was talked about or you know really instilled in the home or anything like that. But you know, after you know me being placed in a situation where I, my life is on the line is it challenged her to, you know, reevaluate her views. Now, presently, you know, um, of course, you know, I, I'm opposed to the capital punishment system as it currently exists because I know it's unfair. It's arbitrary and it's cruel in the context of, you know, the prolonged, you know, 10, 20 years, you know, um, grueling, you know, aspect of waiting to die. Is, you know, to me, that's, you know, extremely, you know, unfair, and it, it, it isn't just. So, and, and in, in, in addition to that is that, you know, I've since I've been here, we've had like 35 executions, and in the same, you know, um, time as I've seen six innocent people walk free from death row and go home. So, you know, just the disproportionality of, you know, innocent people compared to the people that's being executed, that's like one in six people. So, you know, and there's actually people here today still that are innocent. And, the, you know, the system, the way that it's designed is that it, it, it takes so long before a person can actually get any relief in the courts now because, you know, when a person is found guilty, 
even if it's on the flimsy of, of evidence, is that the courts, they aren't going to, you know, investigate and find if a person innocent or not. They ain't even going to question the verdict. They just want to know if you had a quote-unquote fair trial. And, you know, so just the arbitrary nature of, you know, pursuing the death penalty, you know, um, the fact that the standards of evidence are so low that, you know, it's more geared towards ensuring that a guilty person don't escape punishment as opposed to protecting the innocent and making sure that the innocent person isn't convicted. That just seems like the priorities are backwards, in my, in my opinion. So, you know, in addition to the racial disparities, and on and on and on, I just believe that, you know, the death penalty as it's practiced in North Carolina as well as America, it just ain't fair. Mm -hmm. Can you give us the names of the people on death row who you know are innocent? Oh, yeah. Um, Stacey Tyler and Enrico Fowler. Those are two innocent people that's on death row. Both of them been on death row over 20 years. Um, and, and in regards to Enrico Fowler, he actually had 10 alibi witnesses that could have and would have testified on his whereabouts on the, you know, the night in question. And, you know, it just was a result of poor lawyering on the trial, the pretrial aspect of things that, you know, he never got an opportunity to get his alibi witnesses to come to court and testify on where he was. And like I said, you know, now, you know, after a jury's, you know, rendered a verdict, is that the courts, they, they don't call that in question. They just want to know, you know, did he get a fair trial? So unfortunately, he's gone through virtually all of his appeals and is at, you know, the very last stage, you know, if the RJA um, ends up getting overturned or they resume executions, he'll be one of the first ones in line. I remember him. He was in my writing class. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about your time in solitary confinement and what that was like for you? Yeah, um, solitary confinement, you know, I never imagined I'd be able to, you know, actually survive such a long, you know, experience on solitary for me. And I, you know, I hate to say it because, you know, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's embarrassing. But, you know, to me, one of the worst parts about solitary confinement was, you know, just the feeling of fear and feeling helpless. Is when I did time in solitary, is that it was it was very brutal. You know, I, I ain't gonna sugarcoat it, is that a lot of the guards at that time, you know, they took you know, took advantage of opportunities to, you know, um assault inmates, you know, for at the slightest provocation. You know, I, I at one point in time as I held, you know, correctional officers and law enforcement to a very high standard. I was brought up to respect, you know, those in authority. And, you know, always felt like that, you know, people in authority were held to a high standard. You have 60 seconds remaining. Than the average person. And so, you know, when I when I experienced things that, you know, showed me or made me feel like, you know, that, man, they'd do something just like, you know, a bunch of ruffians in the alley would do. Because it just kind of, you know, ripped the veil off my eyes and kind of, you know, left me feeling crushed. And so seeing, you know, things that happen on, on solitary confinement so often, it was just terrifying because I felt helpless and, you know, alone and, you know. You have 30 seconds remaining. It's just embarrassing and humiliating to feel like that all the time. What do you say, Tessie? Can you call back for just a couple minutes? I know you said you have to go at five. Yeah, okay, I'll call back. All right. Well, we'll get to your question, Alina when he calls back. Uh, so there are two very different guys. <laughs> All the uh, co-authors of the book are actually really, really different. Uh, yeah, I can ask the question for you. Um, they're all four of them are different races. They're all from different religions. They're all from different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds uh, and very, very different personalities, which was another of the challenges of, of working on the book together. But also one of the things about it that was really cool is that we were able to get so many really different guys who were not necessarily friends with each other on death row to work together. There he is. Tell me, who paid call from? Michael Brunson. And 
Inmate at Central Prison. This call will be monitored and recorded for customer assistance, collection, or complaint. Thank you for using Global Tail Link. Hey, Ellie, I'm all patch you right in. Thanks for calling back. Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID, followed Enter your participant ID. Please enter the meeting password. You are in the meeting now. There are 11 participants in the meeting. This recorded. You are muted. You Okay. We're in and unmuted. All right. Hey, Aleem. Hello. Hey, hey. We have a question for you from Elena. Are you allowed any instruments in prison? They assume she means musical instruments. Yeah, no, nah, I wish I was. Yeah, that's yeah. Um, something, you know, that we just, yeah, we don't have access to at all. Mm -hmm. My instrument pretty much is my hand beating on my table or on my mattress. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about how you you make your music then? Oh uh, yeah, I mean I'm a I'm a writer, so you know I um you know I write, but I come and you know I perform on the phone. Usually all of my rhymes is, has been a cappella thus far. Um, I'm on SoundCloud. Like I said, you you know you can check me out on SoundCloud at Rome Alone. Just go on to SoundCloud. Dot com and then just type in my name. My MC name is Rome Alone. That's spelled with two R's, R R O M E Alone. And um, so yeah, I just started recording on SoundCloud acapellas, and then after you know maybe about a year, is that um I got a little bit of buzz with some producers that wanted to work with me, and you know we still trying to you know iron out all of the wrinkles, but I did get about five songs so far that I did with some actual beats that producers were able to line my vocals up with. And um, we got some more stuff coming. And, you know, I'm very optimistic about, you know, what we got going on right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so we only have five minutes left. Do you have a parting message uh, about something that you want people to know about life on death row or about the prison system? Um, yeah, um, like I said before, you know, um, I just, uh, you know, I can't imagine because I've been locked up for, you know, so long is that, you know, being on death row is that I just feel like, you know, and especially the people that are close to me that I know is the fact that there really are truly innocent people on death row and the feeling that people just are unaware that they are completely forgotten about that, you know, these walls are, are up and, you know, people walk, drive by on Western Boulevard up and down the street and it's like, you know, they're completely, you know, unaware of who's back here. And it just, like, breaks my heart, you know what I'm saying, to know that, you know, some of my friends in here have been sitting here struggling for 20-plus years and, you know, nobody even knows who they are. And, you know, that's, that's just one message that I, I just really want to get out. And, you know, hopefully that... You know, I don't know. You know, I don't know what the, the next person can do, but just that awareness, just bringing that awareness to the fact that you know, there's there's somebody here that's actually innocent, and they're you know sitting in a cell, you know, waiting to be executed, and you know they're very helpless against a system, you know, that seems you know almost insurmountable, and you know, I just I just want people to know that. Thank you. Um. One more thing. What? Uh, huh. There is one more question. Uh, that North Carolina has the Innocence Inquiry Commission. Do you think that will help any of your friends? Well, yeah. Well, see, you know, the problem, even though the Innocence Inquiry Commission is a great thing, but the problem with the Innocence Inquiry Commission is that it only provides relief for people that have completely exhausted all of their appeals. You can't even apply at the Innocence Inquiry Commission until you have exhausted all of your appeals. And as I said, the appeal process can be so long, so tedious, so gruesome that you can be on death row for 10, 15, 20, in some cases 30 years. You know, it was a guy in 2014, I believe,
believe that was um that was removed from death row and exonerated after thirty years. You know, and it was through the Innocence Inquiry Commission, but it was only because his, of his brother, who was a co-defendant in his case, who um, had exhausted all of his appeals and was able to file with the Innocence Commission and get relief. So he got relief, you know, through his brother filing through the Innocence Commission. So even though the Innocence Commission is a great thing, it hasn't been, you know, very helpful for, you know, guys on death row. Yeah, the people on death row get uh, automatic... Um, lawyers, they get assigned to automatic lawyers. Uh, and so they're not eligible for the Innocence Commission, unless, as Aleem said, they fire their lawyers, or they're on their very last appeal, which can take 30 years to get to that point. So that's a really good question, though. Um, I know you got to go, Aleem. So I just want to yeah. say thank you very much for calling in. And um, I'll talk to you Later, I guess. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for having me, and um, you know, I hope you, I hope you guys enjoy the book, and um, you know, get some benefit from it. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Cool. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Any final questions or comments? You can wrap up, Mick. Cool, yeah, it looks like there's some, some thanks coming in from Amanda and Amber on the chat there. Um, so thanks everyone for coming out for the call today. Um, again, one more time, I'll drop in the chat box uh, just the link um, for the book club. Uh, to take a deeper dive into Crimson Letters um, and to hear directly from all four co-authors, um, and then a link to the book as well there in the chat. Um, yeah, again, thanks so much for everyone coming out today um, and for your questions. Uh, I think we had a really great conversation. Anybody who goes on to join the book club, I. Um, I hope that that is a powerful experience for you as well. And thank you so much, Tethy, uh, for your work and for being here and making time for this, um, arranging and making technical decisions, and calling people in and stuff like that. Um, so thanks so much for being here today. No problem, thank you. I hope to see you guys in the book club. It's really great. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Have a good day.